The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. Our webinar today will discuss integrative treatment and nutrition for brain tumor patients. My name is Alex Sierra, and I'm the Research Grants Manager here at the American Brain Tumor Association. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Carolyn Katzen, MSCNS. Ms. Katzen is an integrative oncology specialist with a special focus on nutrition and wellness. Her expertise includes the fields of nutrigenomics, the scientific study of the inter interaction of nutrition genes, especially with regard to the prevention or treatment of disease. She works at the Sims Mann UCLA Center for Integrative Oncology. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Katzen. You may now begin your presentation. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today and for recognizing that medicine alone is not enough. Patients and their families need psychologic and other integrative care after a cancer diagnosis. Unfortunately, there is so much information and misinformation about nutrition available that this topic often causes anxiety and stress. I represent just one aspect of how we support cancer patients and their families at the UCLA Sims Mann Center for Integrative Oncology. We see many people who face brain tumors, as well as other cancers, and we focus on what is possible to achieve to improve symptoms, enhance wellness, and quality of life. Cancer is not one disease, but more than 250 different variations in DNA that result in malignant cellular behaviors. Of these, about 128 are found in the brain. When a tumor arises in the confined space of the skull, it can be particularly challenging to treat. New advances in precision medicine are providing hope, however. For the past 500 years, brain tumors have been classified by how the tissue appears under a light microscope. Technological advances have increased this accuracy using sharper acuity with electron microscopy, 3D imaging, and more recently with molecular cytogenetic and genomic testing. Better understanding of driver gene mutations can guide treatment. For example, an IHC, or immunohistochemical staining test for KI67, describes aggressiveness of tumor cell growth. An EGFR copy number amplification may guide chemotherapy choices. Some genetic mutations are present at birth, or our germline, and some are acquired as we age or are somatic. Crucial changes in the genome affect the chance and rate of the development of a cancer cell. Nutrients found in a healthy diet may protect DNA from damage from the environment and may also support immune surveillance systems. An integrative approach seeks to incorporate current and actionable knowledge for each patient and their brain tumor, which is, is a unique molecular signature. Integrative oncology is a treatment approach that blends conventional as well as complementary therapies. The National Institutes of Health has a center for complementary and integrative medicine, whose mission is to define through rigorous scientific investigation the usefulness and safety of complementary and integrative health interventions and their roles in improving health and health care. Wellness may be conceptualized as a balance of mind, body, and spirit. A diagnosis of a brain tumor is likely to upset that balance. One goal of integrative treatment is to provide tools to the patient to adjust such a balance in a day-to-day -day dynamic manner. At our center, we offer a host of programs that go beyond the outstanding research-based clinical care offered at UCLA and provide many services to complement conventional medical care. We offer patients information, guidance, and support that addresses nutrition, supplements, mind-body approaches, psychological concerns, and all matters of the mind, body, spirit, and emotions. We have a patient-centered model committed to facilitating partnerships between patients and practitioners in the healing process. Some of the science-based tools we offer at the UCLA Sims Man Center include mindfulness and meditation, 
adapting ancient Buddhist practices to modern life using visualization, sound, and other modalities to stay in the moment. Some movement-based activities assist in reducing anxiety through centered breathing and balance. Qigong is an example of this, arising from the ancient Chinese spiritual practice intended to align body, breath, and mind. Yoga and Tai Chi are other types of centering practices that may be helpful. Staying as physically active as is safe and achievable helps with circulation, mood, and overall wellness. Vision and sound can prove to be helpful and uplifting. The use of imagination, along with harmonizing music, helps reduce anxiety. Having a few varieties of playlists available before chemotherapy, for example, can help patients participate more proactively and provide a positive distraction. Visualization ideas may include imagining you are on a beach or in a beautiful secret garden. By finding your own happy place to nourish the soul, you may find difficult appointments easier to manage. An important aspect of integrative treatment involves viewing food as nourishment. We are estimated to be exposed to some 23,000 different bioactive compounds on a daily basis, and some of these are beneficial beyond simply providing energy. They help provide phyto, from the Greek for plant, chemical, that may fight cancer, either with antioxidants that protect DNA from environmental damage, anti-inflammatories that prevent cells from turning over faster than normal, thus possibly making more mistakes, and anti-carcinogens, which help remove cells that have made mistakes and prevent them from progressing to malignancies. We will discuss this in more detail in a few minutes. UCLA is one of 11 centers nationwide involved in translating data to information and from there to actionable and useful knowledge. Other big data initiatives are vastly expanding our ability to learn and integrate such knowledge. Integrative treatments include genomic data with a goal of precision medicine. From my perspective, this particularly focuses on bioactives, whether these are in foods, herbs, supplements, or medications, and how such substances interact with a goal of enhancing wellness. The brain is one of the most metabolically active regions of the body. Although by weight it makes up about 2% of body mass, it is estimated to use 20% of oxygen. In children up to 10 years old, this is even greater with up to 50% of resting oxygen consumption being used by brain activity. Oxygen is consumed all, almost entirely for oxidation of carbohydrate. However, some is also used for neurotransmitter synthesis and metabolism. A more recent discovery of immune cells in normal brain accounts for further metabolic activity. A healthy level of iron is crucial for oligodendrocyte health and function. Iron-rich foods include dark meat poultry, lean red meat, and whole eggs. Cancer affects many brain processes and pathway activities. P13K is one of these. Leptin is a hormone that signals fullness to the brain, or satiety. Simple sugars, including added sugars such as those found in lemonade or other sweetened beverages, may affect leptin levels. This is a topic we will return to in a few minutes. Herbs and spices used in cooking are also important in regulating this pathway, which is nutrient sensitive. Examples include curcumin, rosemary, and sage. Some of this research was done with looking at Alzheimer's patients. Cancer cells are even more metabolically active than normal brain cells. New blood vessels form to provide nutrients to these cells. This is called angiogenesis. We know that copper is a trace element essential for angiogenesis. However, it is a ratio between copper and zinc that is crucial for overall health of all cells. Zinc is found in lean meat and shellfish, and we will talk more about zinc a little later. 
So what can you do after a diagnosis of a brain tumor? It makes sense to avoid toxic substances, to have foods that support detoxification, and to provide the raw materials for the housekeeping of replacing and renewing cells affected by treatment therapies. As much of this goes on in the early hours of the morning, a bedtime snack of about 10 grams of protein helps provide essential amino acids and minimizes the risk of muscle wasting. Getting quality sleep and reducing stress where possible also makes common sense. Omega-3s are naturally anti-inflammatory, and we will go into more details about these shortly. Select organic produce where possible to reduce exposure to toxins found in pesticides. The Environmental Working Group is a good resource for learning which fruits and vegetables are more likely to have a higher pesticide load. These, of course, are best purchased organic. Foods that provide nutrients to support healthy cell processes can be thought of as having antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and anti-carcinogenic activity. I like to think of these as the three A's. Many foods, like those in the cabbage and garlic family, are rich in all three. Other foods to eat regularly are those rich in protein and zinc. Here are some examples of foods with all three A's of cellular health. These are rich in protective active ingredients or phytonutrients with beneficial effects on liver enzyme activity. Examples include garlic, watercress, kale, and berries. Protein is especially important for brain tumor patients. And here are some suggestions for how to include an extra serving of protein each day. Try adding nut butters, Greek yogurt, or including some string cheese or hard-boiled eggs for snacks. A protein smoothie is another way to add an additional serving of protein to your usual diet. A serving is about 25 grams and found in about 3 and a half ounces of meat or fish or usually one serving or one scoop of a pro good protein powder, such as made with whey or um, other sources. If you have a busy schedule, you may find a ready-to-drink beverage helpful. As you can see from this comparison table, some are very high in sugar and low in fiber or have a high glycemic load. You may choose to wish to choose one, such as the one at the bottom, or gain, which um, has lower sugar and more fiber. Better still, use highest quality ingredients to blend your own and keep it in handy in a cool place. As mentioned earlier, the primary fuel for brain activity is carbohydrate in the form of glucose. We don't eat simple glucose as such, but we metabolize starches and sugars to provide glucose. Having a diet that has more starches that are either not metabolized at all, dietary fiber rich, or are resistant to metabolism, lowers what is called the glycemic load of foods. Steroids can affect sugar metabolism, and having a high glucose level or hyperglycemia may affect tumor growth by stimulating IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. It makes sense to reduce simple sugars and increase dietary fiber for all brain tumor patients. And this is especially important for those on steroids. Glycemic comes from the gly, sugar, and emic, blood. Dietary fiber improves glycemic load and also promotes a healthy environment in the colon by, provide, by supporting friendly bacterial species such as bifidus and lactobacillus. Without fiber, probiotics cannot thrive. Such fiber is also called prebiotics. Few Americans get sufficient fiber at each meal. The acceptable intake is 38 grams for men and 25 for women. Examples of fiber-rich foods include beans, brown rice, and whole grain breads and cereals. It's important to know that there is no fiber in animal foods. Another group of foods that support healthy brain functioning are those rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Examples include oily fish like salmon and herrings. Omega-3s in the form of EPA and DHA are essential for brain tissue health. 
The American Psychiatric Association recommends one gram or more of EPA and DHA together each day in recognition of their importance in brain health. This slide indicates foods rich in the omega-3 ALA on the right-hand side, such as flaxseed, walnuts, and pumpkin seeds. Some people are very efficient at making this form of omega-3 into the longer chain EPA and DHA. However, some people may need to supplement to achieve optimal levels of these important omega-3s for brain health. Algae is now being farmed to synthesize DHA, which opens up supplementation beyond fish with vegan sources. And here you can see on the left-hand side, the red meat um, is often fed, uh, the dairy products or red meat fat is coming from corn, which is uh, pro-inflammatory, which increases our need for the anti-inflammatory oils. For many people, there is a gap between knowing what is healthy to eat and actually carrying it out. For a variety of reasons, there are barriers to eating and living healthily. Let's address each of these barriers in turn and look at how to overcome them. Sometimes nausea can affect appetite. Some suggestions for managing nausea include having small, easy to digest meals, avoiding unpleasant odors, and using ginger, which is safe and effective. Suggestions include planning ahead, keeping ready to drink supplements available to sip on, avoiding stressful topics when eating, and using garnishes to enhance eye appeal of meals. Many medications may have a side effect of constipation. Examples include temodar, as well as those commonly prescribed for pain and nausea. Constipation can reduce appetite for healthy foods. Some useful treatments include prune juice and dried fruit, which may be soaked overnight. The two main methods of overcoming constipation are by drawing fluid into the large intestine or by stimulating peristalsis. Bowel regularity is a highly personalized topic, and you may need to be patient as you discover your best remedy. If you have diarrhea, um, you often have dehydration as well. And dehydration is another cause of fatigue. Try having liquids only if diarrhea is intense or persists for more than a day. Once it has settled down, you can include simple, easy to digest foods such as the inside of a plain baked potato or some steamed fish. If that is tolerated, then you can begin to add more foods such as banana, rice, or other cereals. Remember to stay well hydrated at all times and can contact your health team if during treatment diarrhea should persist for more than two days or you believe that you are dehydrated. Depression is a very common barrier to making healthy choices. It can be crippling. Reach out for help if you find your mood is consistently preventing you from making self-supportive actions. Love is truly the most healing of emotions and a little square of dark chocolate can lift the spirits too. Getting a good night's sleep is so important. It is during the early hours of the morning when most of the repair functions of the body are at their peak. Try avoiding caffeine after 3 p.m. as this may interfere with your sleep. Make sure to relax before bed and keep your sleeping area quiet, dark, and an even cool temperature. Hydration is also very important for general health. During treatment, it is easy to become dehydrated. A home remedy is to take a pinch of salt, half a teaspoon of sugar, and a cup of water. Pedialyte ice pops are also helpful to keep on hand. Fatigue is best managed with small, frequent meals that have enough protein and key nutrients for red cell production. Hemoglobin carries oxygen, so crucial for healthy brain metabolism. Iron, zinc, B vitamins, and vitamin C are all important for healthy red cell production. Glucose levels are best regulated with fiber at each meal or snack. Bean dip, nut butters are examples of fiber-rich snacks. So having reviewed why we may not be doing the things we know to be supportive for our health, Let's now look at how we can participate effectively. 
A good idea is to keep your own personal record of nutrition-related health data, such as fasting glucose, lipid levels, vitamin D, etc. You can also share any supplements you may be considering or already taking with your healthcare team. Optimize your health span by balancing the previously described three A's of healthy foods. Digestive health is central to overall health. We know that many chemicals active in the brain are also active in the digestive tract, the so-called gut-brain axis. In order to optimize health in the colon, we need sufficient digestive enzymes to break the food down, sufficient prebiotics or complex carbohydrates, also known as dietary fiber, that the probiotics or friendly bacteria thrive on. And having all of these in balance helps to support healthy brain activity, too. Prebiotics are found in many foods of plant origin, not in meat, poultry, fish, or eggs, however. Examples include whole grains, beans, vegetables, and nuts. Another important nutrient for overall health is zinc. Zinc plays a crucial role in pretty much everything the body does. It is especially important in immune functioning. Zinc fingers are regions of genetic coding that regulate how DNA is copied. They are like punctuation in the writing of the script of proteins. Zinc is also a cofactor in the repair enzymes that make sure DNA and RNA are accurately transcribed. This is a very important trace element meaning we only need it in amounts less than a gram a day. Vegetarians and vegans need more zinc. Also, alcohol destroys zinc, so you would need more if you drink frequently. Here are some food sources of zinc, and you can see that lean meat, yogurt, and walnuts are all especially good sources. Another crucial nutrient for the brain is iron. As mentioned earlier, we need iron to transport oxygen. After surgery or other causes of blood loss, we may need more iron to replace the hemoglobin lost. Iron is absorbed best in its ferrous state and with vitamin C. Blood transports nutrients and oxygen to the brain, and a healthy viscosity is vital to its functions. Vitamin K is involved in blood clotting and wound healing. Vitamin K and vitamin D, both fat-soluble vitamins, may both play an important role in overall cancer prevention. I would recommend that you ask for a vitamin D blood test, which is not necessarily standard of care yet, but is very important and helpful, in, helpful information to have. Another metabolic pathway involved in cancer progression includes NF-kappa-B. Spices such as curcumin, fennel-derived anisole, capsaicin from chili peppers, cardamomin, and others may all regulate NF-kappa-B pathway activity. So let's review important nutrition recommendations for those diagnosed with a brain tumor. Small, frequent, easy to digest, protein-rich snacks are best rather than larger meals. Texture is important, as during chemotherapy, the cells that line the digestive system may become more fragile. Highly spiced or very acidic items may also be poorly tolerated at this time. Here is an example of what such a menu plan might look like. Colorful vegetables predominate at lunch and may be juiced if that's more convenient. A bedtime snack is also a good idea. Cinnamon is a spice that may help stabilize blood sugar levels and is tasty when added to almond milk, for example. So, are there some nutrients to avoid during treatment? Yes, there are some interactions between medications and bioactives in supplements that can be problematic. Examples include St. John's wort, 
a supplement sometimes taken to address depression. This is metabolized by the same liver enzyme pathway as many of the newer chemotherapies, such as imatinib. Blood clotting is also affected by several different dietary supplements, including vitamin E in quantities above 1,000 IU. In addition, coenzyme Q10 may interfere with the actions of Coumadin and reduce its effectiveness. We recommend that you always check with your healthcare team about any supplements you may be taking or considering taking to reduce untoward side effects. You may also want to check with your pharmacist to be sure that there is no known interactions. A personalized approach takes such interactions into account and integrates health data. As we learn more about our individual genomics, we are able to provide a more precise form of nutrition support for cancer patients. For example, it's important to know if you do have an underlying condition such as a tendency for high blood sugar before treatment. And many times I find patients believe that they've already seen their doctor when they're seeing an oncologist, but they may not always be seeing their family practitioner or internist at the same time. And it's important to keep your own records so that you are on top of that. Liver enzymes play an important role in metabolizing the thousands of chemicals we are exposed to each day in food, medications, and the environment. Although the majority of us respond with similar efficiency, there are some who are super responders and some who need much higher levels of a medication to achieve the desired results. This field is a combination of pharmacogenomics and nutrigenomics. For example, grapefruit should be avoided if taking imatinib, as they are both metabolized by the same enzyme system. Grapefruit contains an active ingredient that temporarily disables the enzyme. Many people are aware that grapefruit uh, interacts with statins, but it also interacts with many other foods. And the same goes for um, some other bioactives, for example, ginkgo biloba, golden seal. They should be used with caution. We talked earlier about the importance of a healthy colon and microbiome. Probiotics provide supplements of microbial species that have recognized benefits, including lactobacillus GG, which may reduce diarrhea and bifidus longum RO175, which may affect, affect mood through the gut-brain axis. There's a lot of interest in how the microbiome may be affecting mood, and um, we are really at the beginning of this whole field of research into the microbiome. Some especially beneficial foods are those containing sulfur amino acids. These support natural detoxification processes, including support for chemotherapy and radiation recovery. Examples include the allium or garlic family, vegetables like chives, onions, and shallots, as well as the cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, kale, and Brussels sprouts. Asparagus is another vegetable with benefit. We have discussed the value of different foods some reasons why making healthy choices may be challenging after a diagnosis of a brain tumor, and how to overcome such barriers. We also focused on a few particularly healthy vegetables and spices. To summarize, eating to thrive includes regularly choosing fish as an excellent source of protein and omega-3s, choosing fruit, especially berries and citrus, choosing two or more vegetables each day from the garlic and cabbage families. And we encourage you to use culinary herbs and spices often, as these are especially rich in all of the three A's, antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, and anti-carcinogens. Most important, though, remember that food is one of life's greatest pleasures. And we shouldn't be um, only thinking about the numbers but actually the pleasure of the taste and sharing with loved ones. 
I would like to suggest that you eat well with the three A's of health. Include citrus fruit, include culinary herbs and spices often, and make sure to have organic berries. Stay as active as you can and be well. And here are some resources, including the website for our center at UCLA, where there are many videos from our top researchers and clinicians, including Dr. Timothy Clausey, Chief of Neuro-Oncology and Head of our Brain Tumor Program here at UCLA. If you would like to personalize your health recommendations, please contact our center. I would like to end with this quote from Albert Einstein. There are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other as though everything is a miracle. I love that it was Albert Einstein who's such a hard scientist, and yet he recognized the, um, how we really don't understand life, and we should always think of it as a miracle. And being a cat lover, I thought to show you some miracles of love. So I'm here to take questions. And I know I've gone through a lot of material, but um, you will be able to access the slides and the script after this webinar. So um, I hope that you will go back and uh, review them. And I will take questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Katzen. That was a very informative presentation. Um, as you mentioned, you will now be taking questions. If anybody in the audience has a question, please type and submit it using the question box on the webinar control panel on the right side of your screen. Um, the first question we've got is, um, what are the recommendations for juicing or smoothing to ensure proper nutrients? Well, that's a great question. Um, juicing, usually when we talk about a smoothie, um, it sometimes contains protein, or sometimes it might contain some yogurt or something that is more uh, creamy textured, whereas a juice might be a thinner texture. Um, but actually, these words are often used interchangeably. And the key would be to be using fresh, undamaged uh, produce when you're doing that. Um, many people are not aware, but when they go to juice uh, franchise places, very few of the juices are actually uh, fresh. They're always pasteurized because they're using them, um, they make them at the beginning of the day and they pasteurize them. And pasteurization is important. If you're making something at home, um, you want to be sure that the produce is, is fresh and not damaged, as I said before, and also um, you wash it. And then you would want to juice it and drink it as soon as possible. If you think about uh, wine as an example, the longer wine is exposed to the air, the more the flavor changes um, because of oxidation. And the oxidation actually can uh, reduce the nutritional benefit of the juicing. And so what we'd recommend is that you either juice and drink right away, um, and preferably you juice at a cooler temperature because when you heat, you know, some of the juicing machines have a lot of hot uh, motor there, and um, that may destroy some vitamin C, although you need to be fairly hot to destroy the vitamin C, but some of the B vitamins are also what we call heat labile. So you would juice um, using uh, cold as much as possible, keep it cold, and remove the air. You can, there are certain um, ways of doing that using a vacuum if you're going to store it, and, uh, or better still, drink it right away. And I would encourage people to use the protein whenever they're juicing, because we do need that extra amount of protein. And the proteins can come in the form of a rice and pea combination, for example, or hemp protein, um, whey is 
very well tolerated by most people. I used to recommend soy, but I recommend it less often now because I think a lot of people find that it's uh, an irritant to the digestive system. But adding some protein can really boost whatever beverage you're making. Thank you. Our next question involves the BRAT diet and um, noting that it's high in carbohydrates, is there a way to balance that diet to maintain a low glucose while you're taking those foods? Yeah, that's actually a good point. The BRAT diet was originally devised for infants and young children um, who, of course, as I had mentioned during the talk, uh, use uh, 10 times more oxygen than adults. Um, so it, it makes more sense for, for young children, but for adults or older people, we don't want to be getting as much uh, carbohydrate. So something like um, using, actually, the, the update of the BRAT diet is what they call the CR8, which is a cereal, a fortified cereal. So something like uh, uh, whole grain Cheerios or brown rice Krispies type of thing would be a, a good idea. Um, but you don't want to be having fatty foods because that tends to be poorly digested. Um, but certainly some protein and um, the uh, bananas usually provide potassium, which is often uh, depleted when you uh, have diarrhea. Um, and the toast could be from a whole grain uh, type of bread. Great, that's very useful, thank you. Um, are there any nutritional guidelines um, for chemotherapy uh, for children that are undergoing chemotherapy? Uh, yes, something? well, that's a great question because children um, can tolerate much higher concentrations of chemotherapy, which puts quite a stress on their system. And um, bearing in mind that they are tolerating higher doses than an adult would, would be able to tolerate, um, we have to compensate with more protein and more of the complex carbohydrates. Um, in I, There's a, a um, nutrition center handbook, which I have published. Uh, the new edition was out last week. Um, I do have about four pages of individual chemotherapy and nutritional diet recommendations. Um, and most of the chemotherapies that are used with children are listed there. And um, it's very much a matter of making sure that the children are getting enough food uh, to manage that. Um, at the same time, there are learned, um, sometimes uh, if you're having a favorite food at the time of the chemotherapy, uh, children in particular are quite sensitive to that and then they don't want to eat that food again later. Um, so it, it, it's quite challenging working with children to be sure that they're getting pleasure out of food um, and that they're getting enough to eat. Uh, because they will need um, a fair amount of calories, and yet a lot of times they're on high doses of steroids too, which can cause cravings for the not so healthy foods. Um, it, it, it can be done, it's just that it, it takes some creativity with uh, working with a team together to do that and to make sure that the children are, um, are able to tolerate the higher doses. Smoothies are a great choice there, actually. And maybe even, you know, things like uh, frozen um, treats. And you can add some more protein into something like a Greek yogurt. It could be frozen Greek yogurt, um, and it could have a little bit more protein in it. And you can make things into popsicles so that food still is fun. Because even though there's a, li a certain amount of protein, which I consider medicinal for most people every day, um, at the same time, you know, children want to enjoy food, too. Well, we all want to enjoy food, but it's especially important with children. Thank you. Um, so one of the questions has to do with the curcumin that you were talking about, but I wanted to clarify that that is also turmeric. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Turmeric is a, a 
one of the key spices used in curry and um, has traditionally been used in many, many countries as a, um, a way to enhance the flavor of foods, but it also acts to help shelf stability. And curcumin is the active ingredient in turmeric um, and has been really actively researched for its anti-inflammatory and anti-carcinogenic activity. There is not a lot of clarity as to how much crosses the blood-brain barrier in a healthy situation. Um, and much of the research for brain tumors may be coming from in vitro studies. However, in general, curcumin does have um, some quite interesting properties uh, to fight cancer and to um, as an anti-inflammatory. Um, we do recommend that you're very careful where you buy it from because this is one of the spices that may come from China where, or Asia, other Asian sources where it may not be um, as purified. And, um, you know, unfortunately supplements are not as well regulated as we would like. Um, and that's a whole other topic, <laughs> but um, one should be careful where to purchase the curcumin because at worst you could be getting something that is contaminated with heavy metals, um, uh, or at best you may just be getting something you're not actually absorbing. Another aspect of curcumin is that it should be taken with an oil or fat containing food because there is a tendency for uh, almost like a spasm of bile production. Um, when, and some people find that's uncomfortable. So we usually recommend having curcumin supplements with um, something like some avocado or nut butter or something that has some fat in it. Great. I think that exactly answered the question that was posed here. Um, our next question has to deal with whole wheat products. Uh -huh. There. Um, there could be some pros and cons, especially people are trying to kind of limit some of that consumption these days. Are, is there any any thoughts you'd care to weigh in on, on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, nutrition is a little bit like politics. There are factions <laughs> um, and uh, trends. And for the past few years, the trend and fashion has been very much gluten-free. Part of that is because the wheat genomes are very complex and were only fairly recently uh, identified. They were probably one of the last of the main food groups to be uh, identified. And there is a lot of interest in removing the um, antigen or the, the, the part of the protein in gluten called gliadin to see if one could actually remove it from the wheat plant and still have the same flavor and taste and it because it is a staple for many parts of the world. Um, so many people are not gluten sensitive, but um, they're choosing to buy gluten-free products. And I would exercise caution there because just because something is gluten-free, it may not necessarily be um, higher in fiber or protein. Um, there are very few people who do have true celiac disease, which we usually discover in childhood, early childhood, and, and that causes extreme diarrhea and uh, digestive discomfort, and so the children are put on gluten-free diets. But then there are other people who have uh, chronic inflammatory bowel conditions, um, such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, um, who do appear to benefit significantly when they take gluten out of their diet. Um, so whole wheat is basically um, a term that's used uh, for wheat that has been milled and re leaving some of the fiber behind. However, there's a, there's a logo which says whole wheat, um, and then if you look on the side of a loaf of bread, for example, and you see that logo, take a look and see is it 100% um, say 17 grams per, per serving, or is it uh, a lower percent? Um, because again, that 100%, that you want to be having as high fiber as possible if you're having a whole wheat product. 
And um, sometimes there's a confusion with that. Just because something's a brown slice of bread, it doesn't mean that it has fiber in it. It may actually be a low fiber piece of bread that was colored with caramel coloring. And unfortunately, um, you know, it's, it's, you can't always uh, trust that something says whole grain means it's high in fiber. One should also look on, on the label and make sure that it is, um, it has at least four grams of fiber, I would say, per slice or serving. Great. Thank you very much. And then we've got one last question on the ketogenic diet and your thoughts on, on that as a, um, as a treatment option. Okay, well, the ketogenic diet is a, a way of um, modifying the diet so that it contains uh, virtually no carbohydrate, which forces the brain to, make, to use its backup fuel, which are, are called ketones. Um, I believe there was an excellent presentation um, made in October um, uh, by Leon Leonora Renda, um, which went into a lot more detail about how to, uh, how to follow a ketogenic diet. Um, in my experience with adults, it's extremely challenging to do that, um, to get the glucose level in the brain significantly low consistently. But for children who have uh, repeated seizures, um, it, it does appear to be beneficial for some children. Um, I think it's a, an interesting way of um, modifying the diet, but it's not very palatable. And so for many people, it's there's a lot of hardship in doing this. Um, so it's really a personal choice and very much um, something that with adults it may be less beneficial than for young children. Um, but that's definitely something, if you're interested to learn more, I would encourage you to watch the, the, the presentation, which I believe is in your Anytime Learning section of the website, um, that was last October, because she, did, she went into a lot more detail about how to the, uh, the, the, the positives, negatives, and how to, how to work with somebody to achieve that. Thank you very much. You are correct. You can find that webinar um, at the ABTA website under Brain Tumor Information, Anytime Learning, and scroll down. Its original webcast date was October 8, 2014. We do appreciate you addressing um, those questions. A number of them came in, and um, we would just like to be able to address those. So that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank you all for joining us, and thanks once again to Ms. Katzen. For more thank information, oh, go right ahead. No, I was just going to thank you for, for having this um, opportunity. Wonderful. We appreciate the conversation we've been able to have and all the great information that you presented. And again, this will be available uh, at the website shortly, and all registered participants will receive a link when it's available. Um, for more information on the topics discussed here, or for more information on brain tumors and their treatment options, our licensed healthcare professionals can provide you with support or help you navigate the information available at our website. Please call the ABTA Care Line at 800-886-2282. We're going to pause for just a moment to conclude our webinar recording.